Hi, Mike. Well, hello there. Great good to good see you, Teddy. How are you, man? I'm good. How are you? So good to see you. I'm well. Thanks for having me. I appreciate I'm, the invitation. I'm so excited to have you live on the debrief. Uh, it's going to be super fun. Uh, before we jump in, let's wave to the folks at home, everybody who's on. Uh, this is the debrief presented by Bright Hire. Uh, for those of you turning uh, in for the first time, uh, the debrief is a series of conversations with founders, executives, talent thought leaders on how they've built talented and diverse teams. Uh, I am your host, Teddy Chestnut, co-founder of Bright Hire, proud LinkedIn alum, uh, and I am thrilled, truly thrilled to be here today with uh, the inimitable Mike Gamson, CEO of Relativity, former uh, LinkedIn SVP of Global Solutions. Uh, thank you so much for joining me today, Mike. I'm delighted to be here. Thanks for having me, Teddy. All right. So we are here to talk about primarily the lessons that you learned or the experience that you applied uh, growing LinkedIn from effectively zero all the way up through to IPO and beyond. Uh, but first, I thought we could start off with like a little bit of like rapid fire just to get the juices. Bring going. it. All right. What was your first job? Uh, shoveling driveways and mowing lawns. Uh, what was the first hire? Who was the first hire that you ever made? The first hire that I ever made, uh, I mean, depends if you count my lawn and, and shoveling business, but that was, I did it, I did it with a buddy. Maybe we were co-founders, Brian. Um, first paid job, was that the shoe shine? I didn't hire anybody. First management job was at Subway. Cutting the U gouge, patented U gouge, um, and I don't think I remember the first person we hired there. What What was the interview process like at Subway? What was the... <laughs> um, not rigorous enough to not allow rigorous. me to be a weekend manager at fourteen before I had my morals locked down. Okay, yeah, morals and uh, true north integrity. Yeah. In, uh, in yeah. Uh, what's the worst interview question that you have? asked or been asked and you don't have to tell us what which side you were on but just it happened you were in it it happened it was a terrible question well um i haven't been i haven't been asked a bad interview question in the last 20 years so i'll start there um i don't know if i've been asked a bad interview question i think there's always a good answer even to a bad question so if someone asked me a bad question i would like to try to find what they're really interested in and try to answer if i could on that i would say that the worst question that I've ever asked was probably before I understood like labor laws and what you can't ask people. And in, in, as an example, uh, in the U S where you aren't supposed to ask someone where they live, I always thought I was just making conversation like, Oh, where did you drive in from? Oh, where did you, where do you live? And I didn't realize the potential bias that could create in a process. Yeah. So I have done that not recently, no. uh, but I have done that before. You mentioned like how many interviews, how many interview questions have you answered? in the last 12 years. I mean, you had an 11 and a half year run at LinkedIn. Now you're CEO of Relativity. Yeah. So like I would say not, not a lot is the short <laughs> answer. It depends, it depends on the interview. It's like, as an example, um, when, I, when I was hired at, at LinkedIn in 2007, the, the then CEO of LinkedIn I had worked for for five of the last eight years at our prior company at Advent Software. And so he didn't interview me exactly. He, he asked me to join in that way. But when I moved from the job that I was hired to do at LinkedIn into the head of sales jobs, I actually did have a formal interview process. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was really run by Greylock, one of our investors. And, and mm -hmm. specifically, they had an executive in residence, Mike Stanky, who ended up being a really important mentor to me. And he asked me a lot of very rigorous leadership and sales management type questions. Fascinating, we'll dive more into that. Um, last one, is it true that you learned how to ride a unicycle in the LinkedIn Chicago office, like while taking client calls? Or is that <laughs> apocryphal? Um, it is mostly true. I would say my only hesitation in saying a full yes is that I never really mastered it. I could get, so if you picture what that office was like, uh, there was a long run of, of cubes in a largely open format. And there was about a four foot high wall, like light wall, kind of glass wall. And it was just high enough that if you're sitting on a unicycle, you could have your arm on it and kind of stay balanced. And so, yes, for many weeks, I was practicing riding a unicycle and I would use that wall sometimes. And I would fall spectacularly often with a headset on and uh, generally entertain my team through my ineffective unicycle. This okay, last one. Did, did you ever conduct a phone screen on a unicycle? It is highly likely that the answer is yes. I can't definitively tell you that. <laughs> but actually, yes. No, no. I remember because I wiped out once 
And I was trying to explain to the candidate why, like what happened, because literally my headset had flown off. Like it was a really spectacular wipeout. And I had to like crawl across the floor and grab my headset and put it back on. I'm like, oh, here's what just happened. I just, sorry, but that it, it really happened. All right. That's uh, to be on the receiving end of a unicycle interview, something I'll have to put on the bucket list. Uh, all right. We'll talk about some big and meaty stuff now for the folks who are following along. We're going to talk about like building in the early days at LinkedIn, yeah. what you thought about like getting right, prioritizing what you were looking for, like when you were still really figuring everything yeah. out. How things changed as you grew. So growing new lines of business, growing into new markets, geographies, global, like hiring more and more senior leadership and, and assessing for kind of their capability as you were delegating, hiring and building the team down to other folks. Uh, thinking about how you build and maintain culture, diversity, inclusion at every step of the journey. And then now as CEO, what's translated from that experience and, and what has not. Yeah, great. You oh. want to start? That's a lot of stuff. It's like, I mean, that, you want to start anywhere? Like that. That's like, you know, the last time. So 11 and a half years at LinkedIn, take us back to like day one. So this is like September 2007. Yeah. You're, according to your LinkedIn profile, GM of the LinkedIn Research Network, which was a fit. What was that? Yeah, you don't know it today because we wound it down. So let's see. Con so context of my joining, I had been talking to LinkedIn for probably four or five months at that point. Couldn't find, couldn't find a way for me to join the company and stay living in Chicago where I wanted to be. I was running a startup with two of my closest friends and roommates from college at the time. It was going well enough that I wasn't sure I wanted to go at all. And, and LinkedIn was still small enough. When I started talking, it was about maybe 60 or 70 people. When I joined, it was kind of just over 100 and it wasn't obvious that there was a place for me there. So as the first kind of seniorish, ish far away person, when I took the job, I was an individual contributor. And my job description was figure out something to do for money. That's like literally what it said on the job description that I came on for. It turned into general manager of the uh, LinkedIn Research Network, which was kind of just me being insecure about what my title was. And so I tried to have a title that made me feel more secure, I think is what was going on in retrospect. It's clear that it, that is what was happening. But, uh, but basically what LinkedIn was, was starting to take off as a consumer network and was beginning to find its way in terms of the monetization strategies that would end up being what, what drives the company today. And as we were experimenting with a number of ideas, uh, one of them was this idea for research network, which we could talk about or not. But to answer your question on like, what was my first day like? Uh, I was... I, I flew in to what I then did all the time. I flew in and went to uh, the Sunnyvale office, Mountain View office, uh, wherever it was at the time. The peninsula was still new to me when I took that first drive down. And you, we did a, at the time, every person fit in the cafeteria and you had a, every person who joined introduced themselves and they shared a special talent or did an animal noise. And um, I, I did not ask you to do your animal noise. I did an animal noise. Uh, it was a howler monkey, a Costa Rican howler monkey, which I won't do now, but rest assured, I have a decent Howler monkey. Was there a commercial team or was there anybody like selling? Did anybody have a quota? Like what, what did the go to Yeah, market? there were. Yeah, there were. There, there was a handful of people who were selling essentially a LinkedIn hat. The only monetization uh, product at the time was uh, the, the subscription. So, so media was, was beginning up as well. And it was really just kind of the plug-in media. It wasn't like a full robust set of media solutions like LinkedIn had several years later. But there was a team selling individual subscriptions, the same type of premium subscriptions that LinkedIn have today, albeit a much smaller feature set. And the big ticket item was trying to sell a package of those under a single invoice. That was like the benefit of buying from an enterprise rep is you could have the 10 people in your company or 20 who wanted subscriptions on a single invoice. Got it. Okay. So fast forward 10 months, this, whatever that thing was, the single invoice thing just wasn't going to be a huge business. You wind that down, you become head of talent solutions. Like recruiting is now going to be a thing. You're scaling up a go to market motion and team. What were like your first couple priorities as you thought, as you made that transition to build the talent solutions business? Uh, specifically, as you thought about building the team. Yeah. So I got some great advice. I basically, I tried to put, I, probably, I tried to put to work. Some of the experiences that I'd had in my past, at that point, I had been managing people for eight or nine years and some great advice that I had gotten from, from mentors like, like a, a Mike Stanky. So Mike Stanky's 
advice to me on taking on the head of sales job where I was super unqualified to be a head of sales. I had only sold myself for about five quarters and that was more than five years before I'd been a product manager and a product marketer for most of the time prior to LinkedIn. And, and what Stanky told me was, he's like, make your number one hire your sales ops leader. You really need to find an extraordinary sales ops leader. It's got to be a partner. You won't be able to do it well enough yourself. And, and so one of the very, very first hires that I made was, was Brian Frank. And Brian ended up being an extraordinary partner for me. I know many people uh, who may be watching this now, perhaps work for Brian and work with Brian. He's still an you know, extraordinary close friend. Uh, he's a COO now at an incredible uh, startup cameo. And he became a great executive in his own right. You know, he was managing about a thousand people on, on, as, as he had left LinkedIn, had a great 10 year plus run there. But there is no way that I could have built for LinkedIn what LinkedIn needed without someone like Brian. And then also, you know, another, another extraordinary early hire uh, was, was Dan Shapiro, who succeeded me in every role that shifted for me at LinkedIn and, and is now the COO at LinkedIn running a, you know, a gigantic commercial enterprise. And, he is, and he, every time that he took over a role for me, he improved it. Like every single time uh, I thought I was doing it as well as I could do. And then Dan would take it and make it like much better. And I'd have like a big, a big dose of humble pie to watch when someone who's truly extraordinary steps in your shoes and shows you what's possible. And he's done that at every turn. And so the folks who are at LinkedIn right now are so fortunate to have him leading the, the organization in the way that he does. And he, he contributes so much more broadly than just commercially, but but I, I, I lucked across Dan, and then maybe there's a lesson in here, uh, Teddy, because <laughs> Dan is the only person I ever remember who responded to uh, the job with a with a, a job post with a kind of a letter back that was saying, "Well, I see what Mike, why you're trying to hire for this role, but actually, the role I think I should do is this much bigger role." And the way that he responded was so out of the norm that I was like, "Who is this guy? What, what's his deal?" And and so uh, I really. Uh, and actually, from that very moment, you know, Dan continued to reset the bar of what's possible, both in the job that he was trying to apply to and in the role that he did is taking over the research network, uh, taking over talent solutions, taking over the, the entire organization and now uh, really leading so much of the company. So a couple lessons there. One, early hires matter a lot. Yes. Mass, massive upward you know, trajectory from a couple of those early hires. Uh, there might not be a clear playbook for some of those. Like, had you hired a sales ops lead before? No, I didn't know what it was. How did Definitely so? Not. Like, how did you figure out? Okay, I have a new role. I've been told this is the most important hire that I'm going to make. You end up making a hire who becomes, you know, COO, has as long a run, you know, tenure as you. Yeah. How do you get that right? Like, what were you? Who are you drawing on? What resources? What counsel yeah. to make that pivotal of a hire that well? That yeah, for, for, it, for, for me, it started with a few things. So one is just to be really clear with where I'm ignorant. And I was ignorant about what it, like what it took to build a great sales organization. I was totally ignorant. And I tried to approach that with some humility and with some vigor to attack my areas of ignorance. And so whether it was Mike Stanky or whether it was other sales mentors who I sought out, I asked a lot of questions mm -hmm. about what even is sales operations? What, it, what does it need to be right now? Because when you're a team of just a few is very different when you're a team of thousands. And it's a very rare person like Brian did that can scale from being, you know, a team of one to, you know, a team of many. And so what, what I found was if a whole sales organ, and this, this is a gap analysis, I suppose, Teddy, if, if the whole, if a sales organization needs to have this series of skills across the leadership team, and I am only skilled in a subset of those, I need to make sure that the people who I have, that I'm locking arms with in building something are very complementary to me in the things that I don't do well. Mm -hmm. and, and so I began to define some of the sales operations, things that we must be great at, but that I wasn't myself great at as part of that list. And then Brian was just a unique candidate. He had, he had a really interesting background. He did everything from, you know, he was an attorney. Uh, he had a real estate background. He worked in enterprise sales and ran a sales territory. He, he was very comfortable with systems. He was extraordinary process oriented. And he knew how to, and it was tough. Stanky also said, you need a bad cop, Mike, because you don't feel like a bad cop and you need one. <laughs> and he was right about that. I needed someone who was, who was tough and who could 
you know, be very clear about what the rules of engagement were going to be and who could be black and white on a number of important topics that require assertiveness. And so Brian was both a great foil for me and someone that I learned a lot from. It's, it's What's interesting is that a lot of what you're describing is not the stuff that's in a job description. It's not, yeah. here, here's a sales ops leader. Yeah. Here's, here's the criteria for the role. Here are the responsibilities right. that you're going to do. A lot of that was, who am I? And what kind of a partner do I need yeah. in an individual? Which is like, that's why we interview, right? It's like, you need those intangibles. You need to dig and figure that out. Yeah. What, yeah, what does the business require? What subset of that can I do? Where am I deficient? And how do I complement myself with people that fill that gap and, and make us more than I could have been on my own ever? Today, the when people think of an interview process, they think, okay, hiring manager is gonna have a conversation, then we're gonna have this person talk to a bunch of other people, then we're gonna all come back in a room and then we're gonna debrief. Was that the process you applied like at that early stage or was it like you and I need to spend a lot of time together? Like, did you outsource any of it to other folks? What did, this, what did the process look like? Yeah, so so um, let me try to answer a, a you know, question directly, but first with a background anecdote, one of the biggest hiring mistakes that I ever made happened before LinkedIn. When I was working at Advent Software, I was a new manager. I had just taken over a team that I was, I felt very intimidated to take over. They were materially more experienced than I was. I was 24 years old. They were materially more experienced than I was. Um, I didn't know what value I could offer them. And I was really interested in not failing in their eyes. I really cared what they thought. And I really, I thought that I could through kind of some consensus building, get to the right spot. We had an open role on the team. I knew more or less what I wanted in that person. And I, I, I thought that I found it in this candidate, candidate who I just loved. I was so excited for the rest of the team to meet her. And so they all met her and she was a real bar raising person, just next level candidate in so many ways. The big mistake that I made, well, there was a few, one was I didn't make it clear to my team of direct reports what their role was in the process. I made them feel like they had a vote and that we were going to count votes reasonably equally. Mm. The next one, so I was not clear. The next mistake I made is that I brought everyone back together for a group feedback session. Mm. And oftentimes when you do any kind of group feedback, if someone's neutral to negative and starts early, it can kind of color the rest of the feedback. And that's exactly what happened. I didn't think through the impact of bringing a next level person into a team who might feel intimidated by that person, mm. who might not want a person like that setting the bar on the team. But what happened was the first person gave kind of neutral feedback. The second person was a little neutral negative. By the fifth or sixth person, it was like, we can definitely never hire. Do not hire that person. And so because it had all been aired, I felt like I backed myself into a corner mm. of either I hire this person and they'll be rejected by the team because it's been so clearly out loud they don't want her. Or I don't hire them and I've missed an opportunity. And I, I did the latter and it's like stuck with me. You know, it's been almost 20 years from now, but it's, it was a huge bummer. And so from that process, you know, now to your question on when building this team from at LinkedIn, I, I definitely am interested in the opinions of others, but not as a group ever. And with much more specific intent in mind, hmm. you know, I also felt like what I wanted to build in a sales organization was not necessarily what I had seen in other sales organizations. I had never, I had some baggage in thinking about myself as a sales leader. The word sales was something that I didn't resonate with. I didn't have an identity of self as a salesperson. I think I, like many, were influenced by, at least in the US, the kind of canonical standards of salespeople, whether it's Willie Loman or uh, Alec Baldwin, or these are not positive examples. Not, not positive examples. And so there are very few people who, little kids who grow up, I want to be an astronaut. I want to be a, 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 an athlete or a dancer. I want to be a salesperson. And like salesperson is like, doesn't make the list a lot. And yet. Yeah, re so recruiter. Recruiter is another one of those. Right? Like a rec and yet being a recruiter, which is being a salesperson for a company right. uh, and being a salesperson of a product, it's a fabulous lifestyle. You talk about something you love all day long and that you're proud of. You encourage people in recruiting to change their life to join you. Totally. Right? And, and make no mistake, making a career decision, you're changing someone's life. So you're selling the most important possibilities, most important ideas to them. But yeah, for whatever reason, people have a bad idea of it. And I too was influenced by that culturally. Mm -hmm. And so when I set out to build a sales organization, I really set out to build something other than that, which I had seen. And so we started with some 
first principles, like we wanted to hire unusually intellectually curious people who could do anything, but who chose to sell as opposed to those who just sell because they have no other options. Mm. And so just that starting place, looking for unusual intellectual curiosity, how do you test for it? How do you look for it? And so I'd say, Teddy, that was probably the departure point that made me have an uh, atypical hiring process in the beginning. Yeah, and, I was, and, yeah, I was yeah. gonna ask, like there's, there were a number of early hires that went on to be incredibly successful. Like Shapiro, you mentioned right now, COO, Ryan Longfield grew through the org and is now CRO of Gong. David Cohen, who like started as one of the first AEs, now leads the whole North America business. Mark Labosco re- leads the whole town switch business. Was there something that was like, you know, in common about how you assessed for those individuals? That you know, it's it's it feels unusual to hire a group of folks at that early of a stage who have 10, 11, 12 year runs. Like clearly there was something about the hiring process that identified upward potential, the ability to grow into like bigger shoes. Yeah, what, what, I, I'll what? tell you what I did. I don't know if it's replicable, and maybe we just got lucky, but you know, I feel like that intellectual curiosity thing and some humility is really important. So the, for the first several hundred people that I hired, I asked uh, kind of a case style question. I asked them to engage with me on the question of uh, how heavy the world was. And so if, if there's anyone listening right now who was, you know, at LinkedIn 2007 to 2010, I'd probably ask you that question myself or someone on the team did. And then we would talk for 15 or 20 minutes about the approach to that problem. And the answer is not super relevant, but the idea was like in any case problem, it's really, how do you approach it? How do you take something? And if you're gonna answer like, well, you can't heaviness and space vacuum, there is no, you're talking about mass or you're talking about weight. So, so all kinds of different approaches. And I remember lots and lots and lots of the various answers and how people attack the problem. But the idea was, hey, we're working in a company where there's a lot of stuff not figured out yet. Mm-hmm. And we're gonna to have to figure it out together. I want to simulate as closely as I can what it's going to feel like when you and I are working on something hard together, but we don't know the answer Mm -hmm. and we're just rolling up our sleeves and we're doing some whiteboarding and thinking together. So we use it as a device to get to the root of what it's going to feel like to problem solve with you. And is that scalable? Probably not. Were there other, looking back at it now, you know, 15 years or 12, 13 years later, was there bias in it? Possibly. Probably, uh, but it is what I did. And, and, and I asked that question hundreds of times. So you alluded to something which was, it, it might not scale. Yeah. Was, I don't know the exact date, but there, I'm sure there was an inflection point where it felt like, oh, we figured this out. We need as many bodies as possible on the go-to-market team. Like we've got to ramp and move incredibly fast. How did your hiring approach to hiring, approach to building a team change as you thought about like, oh, we need to move incredibly quickly to capitalize on the opportunity? I think it was, yes, that happened, but, but never at the, never at the least the conscious expense of quality. I mean, moving fast is important, but moving fast does not include making bad decisions on people because anyone who's ever had a hire for a team knows the single thing that will slow you down more than anything else is hiring the wrong person. Mm-hmm going through that several month period of like, you know, it was wrong, but you haven't really dealt with it. And now you're dealing with it, which is painful. And then you have to go back and start again. So sometimes you have to go slow to go fast for sure. But also I try to have really present in my mind, whether it was before at Advent or, or at LinkedIn, or certainly now at Relativity, every hire that we make and every hire that you make, wherever you're working right now, if you're a hiring manager, has a binary impact on the company. It makes the company stronger or it makes the company weaker. You have raised the average of people on your team or you have lowered it. That's it. Those are the only choices. The likelihood that you're bringing someone on who's exactly in the middle approaches zero. And so if you approach every single hiring opportunity with the the recognition that you're either making your company weaker or stronger, better or worse right now in this moment by extending this opportunity to this person, I think it I think it helps in avoiding the potential conflict of speed for quality. You just can't afford to do it that way. And then, you know, a great mentor, you know, told me, Mike, there's no shame in making a bad hire. We all do it. There's this shame in not dealing with it swiftly. And so when we do make bad hires, you just gotta deal with it. You gotta own it, made a mistake, handle it respectfully, allow that candidate now employee to leave with dignity, and you gotta move on. 
was there a recruiting team, a talent acquisition team? Like what was the level of maturity of, of that partner as you were scaling in the early days? And like, what did that partnership look like? Like, what did you lean on them for? What did you learn from them? What was the most valuable stuff that they brought to the table for you? Yeah, so there are definitely were different people in the very early days. I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about early days LinkedIn? Yeah, early days LinkedIn. Yeah. As you, as you really yeah, ab- that, yeah, so absolutely. You know, we went through the process of there was an HR generalist who did everything to now we've split off talent acquisition and then finally talent acquisition kind of just for my team and then talent acquisition for like every facet of my team in various regions around the world. Mm-hmm. So we did go through that normal process of as the company scaled, so too did the talent resources to create the environment that enabled our success. And, and any business operator anywhere who needs to do a lot of hiring knows exactly how important that partnership is with their, with their talent partner, both, both their TA partner, their talent acquisition partner, but it could, could be their employment branding partner, could be the general talent organization, and it could be you know, the, the total rewards folks who are gonna be helping you get folks in the door and making sure you don't have a leaky bucket of, of people who leave the company after you've worked so hard to bring them here. So for, so for me, I had great partnership throughout. I would say that as we went from super under-resourced startup with Generalist to a company that had realized the biggest economic engine, at least for the maybe first half of the company's life, was going to come from a talent business. And we had the obligation to be extraordinary in, in talent acquisition. We got very, very fortunate with uh, some fantastic talent leaders leading our whole talent organization and certainly our talent acquisition organization who were creative, innovative, you know, incredible thought leaders in their field and who love to do it you know, with and for us for years. What was the, I mean, in the early stages, folks often think about the partnership as sourcing, like we need candidate flow. Yeah. What, what, was there anything beyond that, that the early talent partners were providing to you, educating you on, helping you think through that, like gave you a light bulb moment to really help you scale effectively and avoid mistakes? Yeah, I, th- I think I think it was a partnership. I mean, it's a little bit weird because we at LinkedIn were building tools for talent acquisition, and yeah. so we had a we had an advantage that most companies don't, which is to use all of our own tools ourselves. And so, where I would say most organizations have a partnership between the operators and the talent acquisition organization, where there's some amount of shared responsibility for sourcing, at LinkedIn. Today, still, I'm sure, and certainly in the early days, you had access to the greatest recruiting tools in the world. You better be using them. And so there was a different expectation of what a hiring manager needed to do to pull her weight in this hiring process. Yeah. And so, you know, I would say some of the, the innovative partnership between the operating organizations and talent acquisition were around what should the communication be between a hiring manager and a, hiring manager and a TA partner? What yeah. should the spread of responsibility be? There shouldn't be someone who's spending all their time sourcing if that sourced lead isn't handled thoughtfully. And then how do we give feedback then into the product organization to make sure that the tools that we're using for ourselves are what our clients could benefit from? Got it. So let's fast forward a little bit. So you grow the talent deck, or the talent solutions business. Then you launch a number of other businesses. You launch sales solutions, right? You grow the marketing solutions business, elevate a number of others. How did you think about staffing those teams at the very beginning? Like, what were you looking for in the persona, the background, the profile? Like, how did you know that somebody was right to be one of the earliest hires in a new line of business, a new function, you know, within LinkedIn? Yeah, I'll, I'll answer directly. I just wanna make sure that I'm um, giving credit appropriately where due. I did not personally launch most of those things. I, there was incredible people at LinkedIn in every part of the organization from engineering to product to marketing to with even in my own organization, unrelated to my own efforts that launched most of those things that you just said. I had the, I had the great benefit of being uh, at the head of the parade on a lot of that stuff, but that's different from actually originating the idea or even having those first uh, moves towards it. So just wanna be clear and give props totally. to the peeps who did the work. Um, now, to the, to the question of you have, you have a, an established business and you've got new things. Not everyone from the established business is portable in their success to new thing. I would say here again, we experiment and made a lot of mistakes. You know, one of the things that I think technology companies generally, and in my history, Advent, LinkedIn, and Relativity, certainly, the, the openness to A-B testing as the way to get to truth is a huge part of improvement. 
Mm. So you start with a hypothesis of, in this case, to your question, I believe that people of a certain background or attribute or passion will thrive in this new, less well-defined, lots of upside, but some pitfalls environment. You start with a hypothesis, then you test it. And we made a number of mistakes. We would bring in folks who all who, who would say, gosh, what I want is unstructured environment. I'd love to be able, I want some access to white space. That was a real popular thing to say at LinkedIn, white space. Um, and I want to be able to figure out things as I go. Then you drop them in that spot and they're like, hey, tell me what to do. And that wasn't part of the deal. Like that, I, you're there to tell us what to do. And other people who just absolutely thrived, just absolutely thrived. And, and in retrospect, you, we could tell that they must have felt constricted in a more well-defined process because they were just so extraordinary at, at creating process and create and finding where the opportunity really lie. And so I think it's experimentation and being open to being wrong. Yeah. Is that when you hire somebody, you give the example of hey, this person said they want this, then they get in it and they're like, tell me what to do. Is that like a failure of the interview process? Is that like we didn't ask the right questions or probe deep enough? Or do you think there's just no way to avoid make like somebody interviews well and, you know, I think, it's, I, you know, I think Teddy, for me, it's probably, you know, in the fool me once, fool me twice thing. I think in the beginning, I think it's a very reasonable mistake for all parties to make. Mm. If as a leader, though, you allow that to go on, kind of shame on you. Yeah. You know, because we I don't think we realized how different I, I think when, when you're in an organization that has gone from unstructured to structured, from chaotic to ordered, you can kind of forget quickly how chaotic it actually was. And for someone who was bo hired, born into order, who has no experience with chaotic and you put them back into chaotic, mm -hmm. it, it can just be a misunderstanding of someone's readiness or appropriate fit there. And so the first time I think it's okay. The second time it's on me. So, you said it's on me. That's like putting you in the shoes of hiring manager. But you get to a point where like you're hiring other leaders who are, then yeah. hiring other leaders who are then hiring individual contributors. And you need to somehow figure out how to scale that continuous learning, that excellence in hiring, like in pattern recognition across all of those leaders so they all hire effectively. Yes, yes. And I would say I definitely subscribe to the share the credit, take the blame. And if something goes wrong in my organization, doesn't matter what level I'm at, it's, it's on me. And, and it doesn't mean that in a practical sense, I should get in there and do everybody's work. But if we, in, in this case, in this example, if we had a hypothesis that certain types of people who we really care about and who are thriving and whose careers meant a lot to us and to them clearly. If, if I enable the system to persist that suboptimize their experience and therefore the business's experience, that's on me. Even though I wasn't the hiring manager per se, it's still on me. How did, how did you think about scaling excellence in hiring? Or is that something that you, was that something that you hired for in leaders? Did you try to train it in some way? Like how do you get, you know, you ultimately have, hundreds, thousands of managers responsible for hiring. They don't, it's not like they all roll up to like the head of hiring, right? Like that doesn't exist, right? Like you're all yeah. the, head of, the head of marketing. How did you think about scaling excellence and how the team actually hired, assessed so that they didn't make the same mistake twice, that they went deep enough, that they made the right calls? Yeah, it's a super hard answer, Teddy. And, I, and first of all, I, I don't know that, that I was, I or we were ever extraordinary. I, we did the best we could. But there's so many, there's so many important pieces in there. I mean, for example, stuff that we debated all the time was if if I personally, let's say, had learned a lesson through the process of making a mistake, was I doing someone a career favor from having them avoid that mistake entirely? Or am I doing a career favor for them by allowing them to make that mistake and so that they feel as passionately about it as I do? And so there, there's a number of those kinds of decisions where we would debate how off course should we in, allow someone to be before we kind of reach in there and paternalistically do something about it? Because mm. sometimes people have to learn from their own experience. Mm. The, the second big thing that we would sometimes debate, and this I think is important for any companies who get to real scale is what got you there may not get you where you want to be in terms of a very centralized, and let's, let's take the um, how heavy is the world question. It worked for me. It worked for me at that scale. Was there a better way? Certainly. It just happened to be a work for me. But when, when, when you have dozens and dozens or now then hundreds of hiring managers, it seems kind of absurd to have this weird thing that one person used to do be our process. Mm -hmm. And so you have, 
I think we debated and you have to divorce yourself from a centralized one size fits all, whatever that one size is to decentralized processes, recognizing that sometimes there are leaders and organizations who are so much better at doing this than like I could ever have been or was and just giving them the freedom to experiment enabled much better results than I could have imagined. And so the decentralization of, of the responsibility was something that was important to us. And so, for example, we made the decision in my organization that the only hires that someone is responsible for are their own direct reports, which meant that I would never have decision-making authority over bringing someone on who didn't hire, who, who, who didn't report directly to me. Even if I recommended someone to the organization, that person often wouldn't get hired. And we thought that decentralized decision-making was really the best way to empower and ultimately to have the best people join. But it's, it's one of those decisions that people feel differently about. Yeah. Um, you mentioned one of like the, the binaries is like, is this a culture of like order or chaos, right? It's like the content yeah. order or chaos, yeah. which I think is like a helpful way. People talk about culture fit or culture ad when the intangibles of making a hire, yeah. that, that might be one where you're actually using something concrete to say, where are we on the spectrum of order versus chaos in this particular environment? Are you a good fit? Were there other uh, kind of binaries or, or frameworks that you use to define the culture? and like whether somebody was going to thrive in it? Yeah, for sure. I mean, we definitely had the um, bad word coming warning. We had the no assholes rule early. Uh, who wants to work around someone who's just not a good person? And I think that is not super uncommon today. It felt like when we were setting that up as a precept for us however many years ago, 13, 14 years ago, it felt like a big statement that we weren't going to allow just an intelligent jerk to be on our team. And, and that the cultural implication for someone who hurts others or, or is, takes energy from others in that way is not acceptable in trying to create the culture that we wanted to create. LinkedIn grew from, you know, North America to, you know, six continents. Uh, how do you think about hiring globally? Like you're operating in like new environment, yep. cultural uh, characteristics, the nature of the market, like language. Yeah. There's so many complexities that start to get introduced when it's like, yeah. we need to open the Singapore office or we need to open the, you know, the Paris office. Yeah. How did you yeah. and your team approach those sorts? You know, top down, hire local, transfer somebody out. Like what was going through your head as you thought about building? Yeah, the all, all those things. I, I would say, and this is at the risk of like a really silly statement, but it's both different and exactly the same as hiring in North America. So, so first of all, it's clearly different. And, and, and in my first time hiring internationally, uh, I tried to approach it with humility and, and, and really respected what I was hearing locally about how different it was. What I found in my experience, however, was it is, I found it to be much less different globally, place to place than folks who were in different places felt it was going to be relative to the last place. And not just the U S against something else. If it was from France to Brazil or from Spain to Hong Kong, you know, the things that are different. So first of all, let's start with labor laws. They're really different. It's super important to know those things really, really different. Why is that relevant in the company that's scaling? Well, if you use, if you're used to building a U.S. organization, you can make an offer to someone and then they start two to four or six weeks later. That's normal. If you're hiring from a Northern European country, it's probably three or four months until they join. That's important when you're building a plan. That ignorance bit me uh, on my first year of not knowing that as we were planning the scale path that was just naive. So, so start the labor loss. And then, and then really understand you know, the dynamics of the customs in that country. As an example, in Japan, you know, the, actually, in the U.S., like the average person changes jobs 11 to 13 times in their career. We have a certain assumption of job mobility. In Japan, it's between one and two times in their whole career. So the process, the expectations of what does it mean to join a company, how big of a decision is that, what kind of commitment is it to long term, all that stuff is super culturally relevant. How important is the in-person interview? Do you go get coffee? What's the dynamic? What feels too direct? what feels not direct enough. And there's a huge difference between France and Germany on those kinds of things. So all that cultural stuff, yes, different. What's the same? Every human being has a binary impact on the company. The kinds of traits in people, I personally believe that we're much more alike around the world than we are different. 
I believe that, you know, we come from lots of different backgrounds. We speak different languages. We worship different gods. We eat different food, dance to different music, love different people. But there's a lot of us that are the same inside. And people who are ambitious and humble and curious and interested in being part of something great are, in my experience, the same around the world. And so finding that kernel of humanity that works best in your company, whatever that culture is, and cultures are different in companies. And so understanding that of what you're looking for, I don't think it matters what country you're hiring in. Cool. Um, last topic, and then we'll open it up for the Q&A because there's a bunch of questions in here. Um, I remember, I don't know, maybe it was 2015, 16, when like you personally had a very like public uh, like change in tone around diversity and inclusion on the team at LinkedIn, your approach to it, your thinking about it, the importance of it. Um, I'm interested in you sharing like your the journey that you went through as a leader with respect to like your awareness on that topic and how as you went through that journey, it changed the way that you thought about building your team, hiring, assessing, uh, and you know some of the investments that you made, like opening an office in Detroit. Uh, down the line. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's been, it's been, I would say, you know, everyone, every leader wakes up to what it means to be in a modern, in a modern sense, an inclusive leader who cares about diversity differently in different ways at different times or not at all. And really dependent upon one's own background and life experiences. For me as, as a white man, heterosexual from the suburbs in the United States, which is like all the recipe for having blinders on my entire life. Even though I was well-intentioned, I was super ignorant about the implications for me acting as a, as a leader and as a hiring manager in just what felt natural and, and what are the implications, the unconscious biases or the unconscious implications to doing what feels right. Hiring someone who just feels like they could fit in here. I could just get along with that person. All those well-intentioned statements that, end up with organizations that resemble very, very closely their, their leaders, I fell into that trap is the short version of the story. And, and that is despite having every possible aid that could have helped me avoid that same trap that people like me fall into frequently. You know, I'm a brother between two strong sisters, the, the son of uh, a really strong woman, and my, my parents are great. My mom is a strong mom. I worked for uh, my, my great-grandmother was a, the matriarch of our family. Her name was Pearl. We, we named our daughter after her. She has such a big impact on our family. And the first software company I worked for was founded by a woman. The CTO was a woman. I literally have had every, every opportunity to have my eyes open on what it means to be inclusive. And yet, when I started at LinkedIn, I hired a lot of people who were a lot like me. Not just, not just guys, not just whites. Not, but also extroverted or other, other uh, traits that I had, I found in others. And like many, I, I hired people who more resembled me than not. They may have had skills that were complementary to me. And I had been conscious about the, the skills being complementary, but not the traits, not the background, not the experiences, not, not the ways that they perceive the world. And so not everyone has the same kind of moment or has a moment where they wake up to this. Mine really was a lightning strike moment and it happened uh, at a big internal kind of rah-rah event where I had my big global team together and we we're talking about how amazing we are and what great work we're doing. And a courageous woman on my team after that morning said, hey, Mike, do you realize that all morning there was nothing but guys on stage? Uh, and I said two, two really lousy things next. The first was that, no, I, I hadn't noticed. And the second was, well, those are just all the department leaders. And she's like, that's the effing problem. Like, all of your department leaders, they're all these guys, and you don't even notice this. And so that, that really kicked off a series of very constructive initiatives and investments and, frankly, changes in my own life and how I think about things. Uh, it, it kicked off a huge curiosity in getting educated about this whole topic. How do I reprogram myself? How do we re reprogram ourselves? And then that transference of, of energy and commitment moved into a number of programs inside the company that produce different kinds of results, but it happened from that moment. Cool. Um, thank you for sharing that. That's a, that was a very personal. I remember like being in the room for that and like the, like the look around me like, oh, we have some work to do here. Yeah, it's heavy. It's heavy when you wake up and you realize that you've squandered this opportunity to do something differently and better 
and that you didn't, you know, I felt really ashamed about it, frankly. And so, but I'm not done working. And, uh, and so, you know, the, 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 the best time to have done something better is before the next best time is like right now. And so I, I had, I had a lot of that. Well, you might as well do it right now. Yeah. And that, and that's what my energy has been on it for the last 10 years or so. Um, we covered a lot of ground in the last 45 minutes. And there are a couple of really interesting questions, uh, that folks have put in the, the one that got the most upvotes, uh, it relates back to the, the binary framework that you talked about, like you're either you know, above or below the, law, the bar, but there's gradations of above or below the bar. There's like above the bar a little bit, like qualified for the job, or there's like, I'm redefining the bar, right? Mm -hmm. And especially when you're moving quickly, like how do you think about being opportunistic in hiring? Like how much, if, if there's a possibility that we could hold out and get somebody who's not here, but here, yeah. when do you think about pulling the trigger and, and how do you think about like hiring for that? Yeah. Does, this person does the job or is this yeah. person? Be it? it's, a, it's a super important and practical question. Uh, I, I don't have a silver bullet answer. I, I would say that for me, it's a judgment call and there's a few important variables. Here's, here's how I think about it. So if you're hiring a team, let's, let's say you're in a moment where it's a new team of six or seven people and a manager, there's kind of one set of ways I would approach that where I think you could afford to hire some people who hit the ground running and others where you optimize for how far they can run. Mm -hmm. But if you're only hiring one spot right now, it really depends what else you have around you. So if, you, if you've already, and if we use that as the, as the tension, hit the ground running, how far can they run? And the how far they can run, which is something I like to think about a lot is, I don't care what you've done in the past, I'm looking for your aptitude. Mm -hmm. Can you learn quickly? Are you ambitious? Do you have the drive? Do you have the grit, et cetera? If you could have been a concert violinist or an Olympic athlete or someone who wrote an extraordinary paper about a new protein you invented, if you have somewhere in your personal history where you have figured out how to do the work, how to get up early or go to bed late and just get it done and just train and practice and be great, I personally think that's massively transferable to almost any professional skill set. Mm -hmm. That's someone who I would be highly confident in can run far. Now, whether they can in the next three months be as productive as someone else who's done a very similar job in the past, well, that's unlikely. And so sometimes you have to balance the portfolio of investments you're making for those who hit the ground running and those who can run far. So there's another question that was in here, which relates, which is how long do you give a new hire to figure it out? I'm sure the answer is it depends, but how do you think about the qualifications on it depends? Yeah, it depends by level, depends by job complexity. It's much shorter for, for like a, a, a very early, like let's say, let's say you're hiring for a sourcer, for a sales development person, for an entry level at any function where the job definition is narrow and the repeated action is high. And so you just have more at bats where you can understand quickly the extent to which this new employee is performing above or below the standard that you set. Mm -hmm. There are other jobs, especially being as an executive or working a more senior job, especially that have longer lead times to understand impact. And I think you have to be, you have to be thoughtful about how you set those things up, those criteria for success. But at the same time, I would say, you know, hiring managers, like use your judgment. And the number of times I've hired someone who's extraordinary where I didn't know they were extraordinary early on, very few. So when you've hired a star, you almost always know it, in my opinion. When you've hired someone who's not going to work out, that's different and murkier because we have such like a deep psychological distaste for failing in our hiring decisions. And we create this massive rationalization framework about, well, maybe this or maybe that. And so I think if you're asking yourself, this is another great thing a mentor told me. If you're asking the question, you know the answer. Yeah. If you're asking yourself, is this person like good you know the answer is not for you right now, probably. Because you don't ask yourself that question for the people who are extraordinary. That's right. Um, we had, what's your favorite interview question? But I feel like we already got, how heavy is the world? Is there? That used to be. I think that's an absurd question right now. You know, <laughs> um, I, I, I like, it depends on, the, depends on the hire. You know, if I'm, if, when I was hiring salespeople, I like to understand what the first thing they did for money was. And, and I frame it that way instead of your first job, because I think that there is a correlation between people who've been hustling their whole life. Like, were you the kid with the lemonade stand? And by the way, if any of you are managing sales teams, ask this question to your teams, and I bet there is a much higher than normal population set of people who hustled for money before they had some normal job. It was lemonade stand, if it was shoveling driveways, if it was 
selling whatever, there's this really, really strong history that innate sellers tend to have about figuring out ways as a kid to hustle. Yeah. Um, you, you saw LinkedIn through like, you know, many, many phases. You saw individual lines of business grow through many phases. Talked about like chaos versus order. Was there anything else that when you're making like the early hires really needed to be different about them? Uh, I mean, even think about like LinkedIn before, like LinkedIn had, I don't know how many, 10 million members, like it wasn't a big thing. You're evangelizing in the market. Hey, here's what we're all about. Like, was there something yeah. different? Did, like the profile of the seller look really completely different than the profile of the seller, you know, at Tao Solutions today? I think, I think not really different, but significantly different. Meaning, you know, when I used to call on behalf of LinkedIn, I used to have to say, no, not Lincoln Financial. Whenever I would call, I have this Mike Hampton calling from LinkedIn. People always thought I was saying Lincoln Financial. Maybe so I live in Illinois and there's Lincoln's like a thing here. But it went from being a non-recognized brand to a recognized brand. And so the type of folks who thrive in a startup, you know, like let's say, you know, Teddy working, working for you, they're going to have to be comfortable without the massive air cover of global recognition of their brand. Mm -hmm. And that is just a different process. It's a different process when you're a hiring manager bringing someone into a company where you have to tell them about, no, really, I know we're just four people right now, but we are going to be incredible. And that's different from, look at our incredible people. We already are incredible. And so I just, it's, it's all of those little things. And someone either really wants to do that or, or doesn't. Yeah. Um, we have one from, from Eric. What's the thinking specifically about going from hundreds of employees to thousands? So you know, that yep. specific journey, one mistake that you made, one thing that you would do over, or one thing that like you felt like you got right and is and was essential to making that jump effective. Yeah, the one thing wrong is definitely not starting earlier on consciously building a diverse team because if you start early, then the natural default that people have of hiring people like them ends up in your favor. Mm. If you get to it late then you have to put an extraordinary amount of energy about redoing your process. So that, that I would definitely do differently. Uh, something that went right is we decided to really focus on communication and the importance of multi-format communication, recognizing that one of the things that is correlated, and we, this is a big fear of ours in, in the past at LinkedIn when we were growing quickly. What if when we grow, we start to suck in some way? What does sucking mean? Bad decision-making, slow decision-making, culture is lousy. But there was this like looming fear of, Growth in size is causal to something negative about working there. I remember so we tried to, it was like billion dollar startup. Like we are going to stay a startup. We're gonna yeah, ex it. exactly. Another, another, another great spare idea. Um, but, but, but one of the things we tried to pull, pull out of that is, well, communication is so important. And so when you're small, you communicate by just popping up your head over the cube or doing a Slack or whatever these days. But when you're big, you have to be so much more conscious about it. So we tried to be serious about video. You know, we tried to understand this format 10 years ago before it became the norm. Tried to be clear about all hands and cascading information and when to email, when to call, when to text, when to use video. And that communication focus was helpful. Yeah. So in the last four or five minutes, you're now CEO of Relativity, business at a different scale than LinkedIn, but in, in a role that it's also a completely different scale. Like, what what's different as you think about building a team and hiring from the vantage point that you have now as CEO versus you know head of, as you have sales? Um, yeah, what's different? What's the same? Yeah, it's a fair amount different. I mean, so I had the great fortune of joining an extraordinary company that already had great momentum. Andrew Sage is the founder of Relativity, and he he founded the company. He ran it as CEO for the first seventeen or eighteen years of its life. And so the first thing was just have some humility. I'm stepping into some big shoes from an extraordinary person, technologist and leader. And the Relativians who built this company are amazing. So before I exert any of the things that I learned, I got to go to school and learn us because it had been working. You know, it's one thing if you, if you move into a new company in a senior role for a company that isn't working, it's a different, totally different dynamic. I was extraordinarily fortunate to move into the senior role in a company that was thriving. Mm. And, and it was so different from my past experience. And so learning about us, what is the culture? And the culture at Relativity is this passionately 
invested in as the culture in my last two companies, but it's so different. Mm. And so just the recognition that culture matters everywhere. In some places it matters you know, deeply. I've been fortunate enough to work in three tech companies where it matters deeply, but to recognize that the right move, at least for me, is not to try to bring the culture of last place in a new place, but first to look around and observe and appreciate what the leaders and the, the, the frontline workers inside these companies have created in terms of that culture. So then in hiring, how if every person, again, binary thing, if every person improves the culture or hurts the culture, it's very difficult to make a hiring decision, in my opinion, until you've understood the culture of the place that you're joining. Mm. And so learn first, observe, and then try to figure out what else do we need? Because culture is this, in my opinion, it actually should never be maintained. And I, I would reject the word maintain culture. For any of you who love the culture of the companies that you're working for, I would encourage you not to accept the concept of maintaining its culture. When something is maintained, it's like in stasis. It's staying put. There's other cultures that are evolving positively, which means you're falling behind. And so I think that culture is a dynamic expression of all of us right now. It's, a, it's an echo of the people who used to be here, whose fingerprints are still on the company a bit. But every new person that you join has an impact on the culture. And hopefully that new senior hire is bringing fantastic things into the company that help you become the company that you want to be. And I think it's healthy to always be aspiring to be more as a company. So, so I would say how to learn first, how to figure out what else I thought we needed. And then also certainly where I was ignorant, I'd never managed such a broad set of functions. And I'm, I'm still not nearly deep enough in, in those that I didn't grow up with as a professional to be in any way expert, but the ideas of finding great leaders, trusting them, empowering them to make the decisions that are right for their organizations is, is a consistent uh, attack plan for me. It sounds like a very fun journey to be on. Oh my gosh, it's been so much fun. I'm so, so grateful to be at Relativity and so grateful to Andrew for the opportunity, yeah. We are grateful to you for being here today and spending an entire hour with us to share a whole bunch of learnings and reflections which I think uh, resonate with a lot of folks on the line. Uh, when you have a lot to be doing, learning, building, evolving uh, at Relativity and beyond. So Mike, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this was the debrief. Uh, this is fantastic, super fun. Thanks, thank man, you. it's my absolute pleasure. Congratulations on your big move, I love it. And uh, the debrief is awesome. Thanks for having me as a guest. Take care. Thanks, Mike.